Hello everyone, it's your friendly MC. My name is Nola um, and this is for our LMU Business Insights webinar series, but it's actually a meeting this time because we like to mix it up a little bit. Um, so again, my name is Nola Wanta. I'm the Senior Director of Business Development and Strategy at the College of Business Administration. Our LMU Business Insights series is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with moral courage and creative confidence to be a force for good in the business and global community. We're very excited for today's session as it will be interactive and a little bit different from our traditional webinar. But before we get started, I just want to go over um, just a few guidelines for our meeting today. So um, our host, Nancy Donovan, who's with us, um, is adjusting everyone's screen to be on speaker view, and that is what's highly recommended since we do have a speaker today. Um, so please do type your questions in the chat window. These questions will be moderated after the presentation, although in some cases we're happy to moderate them during the presentation. Um, Actually, since we're in a meeting, if you'd like to raise your hand and interact with our speaker, I think you can do that too. Um, also, feel free to post your comments in the chat. Um, and just as a friendly reminder, this meeting is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So today's Business Insights um, meeting is brought to you by Professor Anna Mongal's graduate courses for MBA and MS in Management programs. Um, and, and both of those courses are management information systems. This presentation is in collaboration with our information systems and business analytics um, department, and also with our AIMS and ISBA society. So all of our data gurus all came together to bring you this presentation tonight. So we're very excited about that. So we will kick off um, our talk with um, Dean Smith first, um, followed by our speaker intro with Professor Anna Bengal. But for now, Dean Smith. Thanks, Nola, and good evening, everyone. Um, that's, uh, for those of you who I haven't yet met, my name is Dale Smith. I'm the Dean at the College of Business Administration here at LMU. It's always a pleasure to kick off an event that brings together our students and guests with a corporate leader who's doing incredible work in their organizations. Tonight is no exception. We're excited to be showcasing this type of corporate talent in the field of information systems and analytics through our ISBA department and all of the collaborating organizations that Nola shared with you. And as a college committed to raising the level of what we're doing and how we're growing ISBA, this evening is particularly special and you are all in for a real treat with tonight's guest. So on behalf of LMU and the College of Business Administration, I'm so pleased to be welcoming David Church Senior Vice President for Senior Delivery Lead at the Bank of America. And tonight he'll be leading us through a simulation focusing on one of my favorite words and concepts, Agile. And now I'll pass it over to my colleague, Professor Anna Mongol, who will introduce David more formally. Over to you, Anna. Thank you, Dale. And David, welcome. Uh, I uh, introducing David, uh, he's an experienced senior leader with over 20 years of background in project management, consulting, education, process improvement, and mentoring. He's been with Bank of America, as uh, Dean Smith was saying, since 2004. And with his current role as senior vice president, he leads, uh, he's a delivery lead focusing on strategy for consumer lending technology department. In 2014 and 2016, Bank of America awarded David with the highly selective diversity and inclusion global award an honor given to less than 1% of the bank's team for those who strive to promote diversity and inclusive environment. Before Bank of America, David worked in big five consulting firms, including Arthur Anderson, KPMG, Consulting, and, uh, and, and Bearing Point. Uh, Bearing Point avoid, uh, awarded David the Beacon Award for his efforts on the Honda financial project. In addition to his corporate experience, David has taught at over four universities in the subjects of project management, process improvement, organizational behavior and leadership. David's educational background includes a BS degree in business administration from USC Marshall School of Business. And he, I'm at the, um, uh, he's done his MBA from UCLA Anderson School of Management, uh, which is where I met him as he joined us as an Eastern Fellow. 
He resides in Southern California and in his free time, he enjoys following current events, stand-up comedy and movies. David is going to be talking about Agile, and as Deep Smith mentioned, he's also going to be walking us through a simulation of this topic. David, welcome. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks a lot for the great uh, introduction, the warm welcome. Uh, so let me bring up my deck. Can you uh, all see the screen? Yes. Great, thank you. So uh, welcome everybody. I'm very excited to be able to be here at Loyola Marymount University and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to all of you. So we are gonna eventually be getting to a simulation as the Dean talked about, but first, actually uh, we're going to be laying a lot of foundation about like what is agile so from what i understand from your uh, amazing dean uh, associate dean faculty and senior director of lmu you know we have a lot of different uh, you know uh, talented young people who are in the lmu program and some of you are already very experienced in agile some maybe not so much so i like to assume that you know we should just kind of walk through the foundation for some of you that already know about agile it'll be hopefully a re refresher, um, and for those of you that don't, then, you know, it might uh, help establish some key foundations. So uh, I'm not going to go through all the background since it was, I was already, you know, very warmly welcomed. The only thing I do want to add that I'm, I'm very proud of is actually starting last year, I was able to join the board of a nonprofit called Central Texas Table of Grace, and that's been one of my uh, greatest recent achievements. So I'm very happy that I was able to be on the board and I volunteer and uh, very closely with that organization ever since. So um, so happy to talk more about that if anybody wants in the Q&A section. But first, let's, get, let's jump into what is and what is not agile. So uh, one, of the thing, one of the themes you're gonna kind of hear me go through as I talk today is uh, I am definitely a big fan of agile, but I'm also a big fan of kind of like, you know, realistically understanding that, you know, there are things that any solution, you know, agile, you know, waterfall, uh, any program, any methodology that you do has its pros and its cons, right? There's no silver bullet that is, you know, your organization struggling and was like, agile should fix everything, right? That's not realistic, right? You know, there's, uh, there's more that needs to happen. And also like, you know, it needs to be done properly, thoroughly and for the right reason. So that's why I want to, uh, you're going to hear me throughout the presentation kind of talk about um, what I kind of call like practical uh, considerations, right? And some pros and some cons. So right now we're going to talk about what Agile is. So what Agile is, is a set of values and principles. Oftentimes just discussed in terms of like software development or technology, but Agile can truly be applied very broadly, right? It's not only something that kind of comes from the tech field, even though it was born from it, right? Um, it is an adaptive approach to product development, whether that product be software or that product could be your radio shows, that product could be you know, clothing lines, or, you know, it's all about kind of being adaptive and iterative. It's a way of embracing change to the extent that change is the driver of what you're doing. So Agile is a catalyst for social and cultural change. It's very, very big on collaboration, adaptive planning, continual uh, improvement, early delivery, rapid, flexible response. As you would imagine, something called Agile should be about being flexible. Um, and it is a big shift in the mindset oftentimes at a team level, individual level, organizational level, because Agile is, again, about making change uh, more fluid, right? You know, oftentimes when we think about doing uh, some type of implementation of a change in our organizations, you know, we, we try to lock down the requirements and the scope, right? Okay, you know, we want to build a garage. Okay, you know, you have to tell me up front everything you want this garage to be before we even start building it. Otherwise, we're not going to start. But, you know, with Agile, we might actually kind of think about that a little differently. Okay, well, what's the minimum thing that we can build in the garage? And then we can figure out more we want to add in a phase two or a phase three, right? You know, Agile attempts to try to say change is something that we can deal with. We don't have to lock it down and wait until something's over. But now, what is Agile not? Agile is not necessarily a single approach or methodology that applies to everybody, right? It's not a cookie cutter solution, so to speak. It's not, as I mentioned, a silver bullet that's gonna automatically eliminate all of your problems. It's a, not a methodology that works when only some of the people used it. So sometimes some organizations struggle with Agile because they say, okay, well, we adopted Agile, so those tech people over there can do it, right? So the information system department can do it, but the rest of us don't really need to learn anything new. We can keep doing what we're doing and we know the tech people will figure out what they need to do with it. That's not a good way of using Agile. Actually, that's setting yourself up for a lot of problems. 
And again, Agile is not a one size fits all solution. So I want to, again, like to set a little bit of a foundation, like compare it with what you could argue is kind of Agile's older brother or sister, right? The waterfall approach, as a lot of you know. So I like to kind of call waterfall approach. Another way to think about it is like, you know, when you see the Olympics and they have that baton, you know, you can think of waterfalls like handing the baton over to the next stage, right? Before you're able to move to the next stage, you have to finish one. That's, that's waterfall, it's sequential. Waterfall has been around for a long time, you know, really kind of formalized in the 70s. Um, it's very controlled, very stringent. It is a nice way to ensure change is understood, steady, safe, risk adverse, right? Um, it allows you to measure uh, progress fairly clearly. You have milestones that are fairly set, right? You know, it's a lot of kind of visibility, so to speak, in the milestones because you are putting something out there potentially that you know may not be done for six months nine months 12 months and only until each stage is complete can you move to the next one so you are relatively clear on where you are in the stage and ideally again you shouldn't move from one stage to the other until you're finished so on the screen you can see two examples of a waterfall there are many different you know waterfall methodologies that are out there and oftentimes like i've said in like in the classes that i teach you know it, you may be used to your own acronym that you've seen you know, for instance, you can see here like software development, you can you waterfall uh, approach could be, you know, deciding on the requirements, doing the design, the implementation, the verification and the maintenance. And then, you know, there are arrows going in all directions as much as it is supposed to be sequential. Real life is sometimes you do have to have change management and scope change, right, to go back upstream so you can make a change. Or if you want to see from like a Six Sigma operational aspect, there, you know, another waterfall example is called DMAIC. A, a lot of you probably are already familiar with that, which is define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And there's many more acronyms that are out there. Like in, in the countrywide days, we had an acronym that we created, you know, it was created before I joined, but we created called FASTER, flow, analyze, solve, track, execute, and review. There's, just because if your organization or, you know, has a different acronym, that doesn't make it right or wrong. It's just all an example of an, a way to, you know, to try to understand and communicate the process of how we're going to go about change. So that's waterfall, right? Now, if we contrast it a little bit with Agile, so Agile is all about iterative, right? You know, trying to break down the type of work you're doing into smaller and smaller and smaller bite-sized chunks. Instead of having this one massive project, maybe we can have a smaller, you know, minimal viable product, something that we can get out sooner than later to get value for our clients, and then we can build upon it and make it better and better and better, right? So that's Agile. Now, Agile probably in some form or another has been around again, like quite a while, but in terms of formalized, you know, popular view, it's been around since around 2000 when the Agile Manifesto was written. There's the most popular Agile uh, framework is called Scrum. Now you can see in the example of what I've drawn here, another methodology you can see is like delivery, feedback, iterative planning, implementation, then you continue to iterate and iterate. Now, if some of you are kind of curious about how widespread is Agile, I have some stats on the right side of the screen. So Capgemini, you know, a major consulting firm based out of, you know, I think it's France, you know, they've done a, a lot of uh, interviews and surveys with different pro uh, project management offices, PMOs. And from what they can see as of, you know, uh, three years ago, over half of PMOs have either used Agile or starting to use Agile. So it's definitely on the rise. And, you know, fast forward three years, I'm sure it's even more so. Uh, CA Technologies seems to agree with that. You know, according to their survey of different uh, organizations, more in the software development arena, eight out of 10 organizations have committed to adopting it. Over half are adopting it. And then uh, a fourth of them have already adopted it. So Agile is definitely heavily used. But as mentioned, it, it, it came from software. So it is biggest uh, client it tends to be in the software technology, but that doesn't mean that that's the only place that we see it in. We'll see a little bit later other industries that are using it. Now, uh, as uh, as was mentioned earlier, if you do have any questions, uh, I'm not watching the chat, but I know our moderators are, so feel free to ask questions in the chat. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going. So this slide tries to, again, contrast a little bit with what we just talked about, waterfall versus agile. So I use the Demaic, uh uh, mnemonic that we just talked about on the left side and gave an example. Like, you know, you could have a, a large project that you're doing in a waterfall take you six to nine months, right, before you see it complete. 
like I, 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 that garage example I mentioned, even though I've never built a commercial garage in my life, it seems like an easy example to wrap our heads around. You know, you could build a commercial garage, let's say six months, right? But uh, is there some, and that's, you know, three-story garage with escalators, you know, a few restrooms and certain floors, make it all fancy, you know, maybe we put some digital kiosks so you can pay for it on the way out. We can build it all nice, all, you know, in one huge project. Or maybe we can get better value if we break into an agile effort. So if you compare it to the right side of the screen, waterfalls, traditional, plan-driven, phase-based, as we talked about, agile focuses a lot, a big part on lean and obviously agile. So the lean side is emphasizing business value, right? How are you adding value to the business? Optimization of flow, continual improvement, um, being agile, right? So iterative approach development and development doesn't mean again, only software development, whatever product you're developing. The hope is with agile, you get feedback continuously. Sometimes one of the biggest uh, cons or one of the biggest complaints that we hear in the waterfall side is I told you all of my requirements up front. You told me you got it and then you walked away and then three months later you come back and you start showing me diagrams and then that's the first time I was able to tell you no that's not what I meant. You misinterpreted or in three months I also thought of something else and I didn't get a chance to tell you because you were off designing something right and that is a legitimate criticism of waterfall. That doesn't mean that there's not ways that you can prevent it but it is a challenge that Waterfall has to adapt. Agile is a bit different, right? Agile attempts to break some of those walls down so everybody who would normally be your client sits at the table with you. And that person who's sitting at the table with you is helping you kind of actually design what you're talking about, develop what you're talking about. And you break things into smaller chunks so you hopefully can see them more. You get more and more feedback. So if you look at the right side of the screen, you can see I attempted to kind of show you a simulation of what, like not a simulation like we're gonna go through, but like a visualization, a visualization, let's say that, of what Agile can look like. I use the same demaic phases because I thought that makes it easier so we don't have to kind of like use new terms. So you can see in each, each iteration, you're probably going to do a little bit of demaic, right? You're going to find a little, measure a little, improve, analyze, control, and then you're going to get feedback and then do more and get more, right? You get feedback. You know, somebody tells you that's great. Let's keep building on it. Or actually, I don't like what you did here. You know, can you do something different? Sure. And then you start iteratively making that item more and more. It's much smaller units. That does not mean that in six to nine months versus two to three weeks, you're producing the same thing. It means that you're trying to take the work that you're doing in those six to nine months and you're breaking them apart and you're exposing it to your entire team. So this the reason why you might be wondering, well, why is a Mona Lisa here, David? Well, first, it's good to expose us all to artwork. Second, it's an example of trying to show agile in action. So you can see here, if we were to paint the Mona Lisa, or if we were to, you know, one of you were to commission a painting of yourself, Normally, paintings are done what you could argue to be kind of a waterfall approach, right? You come to somebody and you say, like, you know, I want to look distinguished. You know, I want like a you know bald eagle sitting on my shoulder and you know, the American flag kind of behind me waving. And then, like, you know, maybe you pose for somebody. You might take a picture. Then you go away, and the artist doesn't let you see anything until they're ready. And then the great unveiling happens, and then you're happy with it or you're not. That you could argue that's kind of a waterfall approach to doing a painting. If we were to do an agile approach to doing a painting, it could be kind of like what you see here. Okay, you want me to paint you? Sure. Then let me first kind of like just sketch in like very light pencil, so you can kind of see how it's coming together. And that might take an iteration or a few iterations. Okay, what do you think, David? Okay, I like it. Uh, you know, now that I see it, I don't know if I want a bald eagle, maybe instead I want a falcon. Okay, I can still change it. I just didn't like pencil. So we're gonna take another iteration to replace the bald eagle with a falcon sitting on your shoulder. All right, great. Um, now let me start coloring it in again lightly. We won't do the permanent colors. We'll do you know ones that we can change. Oh, okay, great. You know, actually now that I think about it, instead of blue shirt, can you make it you know a, a little bit kind of a brighter red so it stands out a bit? Yep, can do. And again, a few iterations change that. So you can see like the product you're doing is evolving in front of your eyes, just like in that example here of the Mona Lisa, right? We're sketching it, we're coloring it in lightly, and then we do the final touches. So you see the product come to life. You see it through either mock-ups or prototypes, um, you know, uh, functioning or non-functioning, you know, in software terms, you know, like you could be on a website that doesn't necessarily do anything, but at least you can see how the website would look and feel, feel and you can mock up how the user experience would be. So that's, that's kind of the contrast between Agile and Waterfall. Keep going. And then there's another view 
that uh, it's an alternative view that a lot of people like. You know, this actually came from a textbook, so you know that's why I, I didn't want to take credit for it, and uh, I can't draw as nice as this does. But another view you could see of Agile is throwing things over the wall or like handing that baton over, as I mentioned. So you know, so the customers are telling the pro the marketing team, "This is the product we want to create." Okay, great. Let me hand that over to our marketing personnel who will design it or start drawing it. I should say, like early kind of like you know, jotting down your requirements. He or she will hand it over the wall to the design engineer and that person will design it. They'll hand it over to the engineer who will start creating a prototype and then they'll hand it over to production and then that way we can start mass producing it. So it's possible you as the customer who asks for this product to be built, widget or a new clothing item or, you know, um, whatever it is, or you know, that painting you commissioned, you don't get to see it until potentially, you know, either way at the end when it's done or maybe, you only get to see it like a month or two later after the marketing personnel, later gentlemen start drawing it. Like, and that's already a lot of wasted time. It's like, no, that's not what I wanted. I wanted something different. So with Agile, the walls go away, quote unquote, right? The walls go away and all of these same people are supposedly kind of like sitting at a table. So in, in pure Agile textbook speak, you know, there should, like, ideally you're actually co-located, you're sitting at a table, you're working on it together. Now, as I mentioned, I'm going to throw real world considerations in along the way. Real world consideration, that's not oftentimes what we, we see actually happen in a lot of organizations. A lot of organizations can't necessarily dedicate 100% of all of these people you see here to say, okay, they'll do nothing but your project for the next, you know, three, six, nine, 12 months. So real world, sometimes you might actually have to like give a percentage. Okay, you know, David can be on your project. 25% uh, of his time, but the other 75% of his time, he has a day job he has to do, right? He's our, uh, you know, he's our main accountant and he's got to be over here, you know, doing the books, but we can try to free up 25% of the time so he can be on your project team. Another real world consideration is, you know, we can't always co-locate, you know, as a, I mean, the pandemic has obviously been a huge example of that, but also even before the pandemic, a lot, a lot of organizations are in multiple places, you know, Bank of America is all across the U.S. and globally, you know, and uh, so are many other organizations. You may not always have the benefit of being able to say, let's all sit down at the table and this is where we're going to sit for the next three to six months. So you may have to do things virtually. You may have to have calls. So I just want to throw that out there. That doesn't mean that you still can't do agile. It just means that you have to like be cognizant of the fact that, you know, you are adapting it to your organizational needs. And that's totally fine, right? To adapt it to what makes sense for your organization. Okay, so continuing on the term of like, you know, uh, the, the trend I should say of learning agile, we're gonna talk about some terms or some attributes, right? So here's some more contrast between waterfall versus agile. So, and if we go through team size, waterfall you, sizes could vary, but you often see like, you know, maybe fairly large team, especially for large projects, you're gonna have large teams on there, like building that commercial garage that I've never built in my life. You know, it could take a huge team, right? You could take 20, 30, 60, 100 people to build that, right? You can have a very large team. Agile tends to prefer smaller teams. You're trying to do your best to break things down as much as possible to the smaller unit of work so you can see things start to develop. So you can still build that garage, but maybe you might have to have multiple Agile teams that are focused on different aspects of that garage, right? And you are specializing those teams and putting them all in the common direction of what you want them to build. But part of the benefit of Agile is that collaboration that closeness you build. So you can start, you know, getting good at working together. And later we're gonna, you know, hear this term called velocity. You can start improving your velocity. In terms of client involvement with waterfall, client involvement tends to be kind of minimized, you know, like, you know, in the beginning, you see the client a lot. And then really it's just certain checkpoints along the way, right? You know, what do you think about this? Do we have your approval? Okay, great. Hey, we have a question for you. How do you want us to do this? Okay, well, you know, uh, or do you approve this? And then what do you think of the final product? Right, so the client gets to walk away to some extent. And then like, you know, you as the team working on it, you know, reach out to client only when you need to. With Agile, uh, that's not how it's supposed to work, right? You know, your client is part of the team. And it may not, you may not realistically be able to get all of the people who are the clients of your organization, but you can at least get what's called a product owner in Agile speak. And the product owner is a, an official member of an Agile team and is officially the one that's representing the business needs. That product owner sets the prioritization for what that scrum team is supposed to do. That product owner is a very uh, critical position, very powerful position, so to speak, because the work that ultimately the whole team is gonna do, and the whole team will have input, but the product owner's uh, role in that team is to help set the prioritization, 
right? Again, with input from the team, of course, but that product owner is the voice, so to speak, of the business, and they understand how that team is working towards the business or client's needs. Now, team durations, again, usually once the project is done in Waterfall, you disband, right? Okay, great job, guys, we're done. Agile, the way it's supposed to go often is, no, that's a dedicated team. Even though your projects might be done, then you know your project goes away and new projects are put in that team. And that team, part of the whole benefit of Agile is cohesiveness, right? That team learns how to work together. So you don't want to disband them when they're done. Ideally, you want to keep feeding them other things that make sense for their you know, subject matter expertise, right? So they can continue to go and build that momentum and have that synergy. Budgeting. For those of you that have had experience with Agile, budgeting can kind of probably make you cringe because budgeting is oftentimes one of the biggest challenges with an agile, but budgeting in a waterfall approach, usually project-based, right? We're gonna pay for that garage and then we're done, dollars. Budgeting in an agile approach, again, if you wanna go by kind of the textbook and that's why you see, I, I say should, but ultimately it's up to how, you know, your organization wants to implement it. Budgeting should focus on value stream-based teams, right? You, you're not doing it just for, that project. You're creating a value-based stream that's ultimately doing something for a particular subject matter expertise. You know, whether you're working at Google and your value stream is, you know, all the ones that are working on Google Maps or, you know, your value streams are working on Gmail, that's your value stream and you get different types of scope put into your project team that, you know, you prioritize as necessary. In, in terms of budget for a waterfall you're dealing with dollars in terms of budget in agile here's another new term you deal with story points right because you're not supposed to be thinking about budget when you're talking about agile so story points are a reflection of complexity and capacity right so as a team tries to figure out as an agile team tries to figure out what it can and can't do it sizes it estimates effort that's being asked of it to do in story points and then it tells you how many story points you know, they, that team thinks it can do in each iteration. And then you see, you know, planned versus actual. And we're going to talk more about that also later about that's how, you know, we, that's the budget terms we use in Agile. So you can kind of think of it, and this is at least how I think about it. Like if you go to Vegas um, and you, you know, perhaps you have a chance to, you know, check out the gambling room, right? When you poker chips or, you know, uh, you know uh, g uh, the chips that you get in the casino, I mean, you can kind of think about that as like the same thing as story points to the same extent. It's still ultimately impacting your budget. Because if you think about it, it is synonymous, even though we're saying story points and we're saying it's a measure of complexity and capacity, you are still paying for people to do the work. It's just a different mindset where you're not supposed to be paying for a particular project, but you're supposed to be giving some level of consistency and assurance that that value stream is going to keep going even after the project's done. There's a lot of other lingo I just wanted to touch on quickly in waterfall efforts. We, you know, we refer to quarters, you know, as three month blocks. I think we're all used to the term quarters, you know, a project might be used to reference a change effort program is talk, you know, is the term used about multiple projects and then requirements are ultimately, you know, what do you want the project to do? So with Agile, you have to learn a few new terms, right? So with Agile, instead of a quarter, you might hear program increment, especially as we talk later when you, when you need to scale Agile for larger organizations. Instead of a project, you could hear Epic. Instead of a program, you might hear theme. And instead of requirements, you might hear features or stories which are underneath the features, right? So uh, Agile is a great uh, methodology, but it comes, as you can tell, with the need to kind of learn almost how to speak anew, right? You know, you might be used to saying like, hey, when is this project going? It's like, I'm sorry, what project? Okay, when is this epic, you know? <laughs> so you, know, you have to learn some of these new terms in order to be versed in Agile. Again, at least that's the expectation. So that's where there is a bit of a learning curve. Now, a visualization of some of this is shown here. So theme, as you can tell at the very top level, are the priorities you're setting for your portfolio, ranging potentially one to three years out, right? Like what does your organization want to do over one to three years? You know, we want to generate revenue, right? You know, we want to grow market share. You know, we want to increase ease of use. What is your theme that your organization are doing? We want to digitize more. Right, we want to be able to offer our customers easier ability to do self-service functionality to make it something that they would value and something that will you know decrease the productivity of the um, some of the time invested that our employees have to do. Okay, that's a theme. Now, underneath the theme, how are we going to enable that? That's where you have the epics, the, the specific initiatives, right, that are going to enable the theme that's above. It. And those epics can be multiple quarters, you know, or a year or so. So that's what we normally would consider like a project. 
right? And then features are underneath the epics. Those are the requirements that are enabling that epic. Underneath a feature are stories, right? And that's when you start getting your smallest unit of product development. That's work that you can hopefully do in an iteration or two or three. And then underneath each story within that particular Agile Scrum team, you would start having tasks, right? Like, you know, okay, I'm going to work on this in order to be able to work on this story over the next two to three weeks. Again, a real world consideration here is a textbook Agile states that stories should always be done in one iteration. But you already heard me kind of say that realistically, sometimes you have some stories you can't break down any further than you already are. And you don't want to put artificial pressure on an agile screen that you must finish a story within that iteration because then you could end up having things that like you know are going to be buggy or defective but that is you know a real world consideration sometimes some stories might need two or three iterations to be able to complete or you thought you can do it in one iteration but you found out it's more complex once you're midway through so you're going to have to take capacity in a second and third iteration to be able to finish it and then I already kind of touched on the second one, the effort required to research or understand the complexity is sometimes not fully captured in the structure you see above, right? Sometimes some organizations will actually use the capacity that comes with the story and the story points they assign to it just to be able to say, okay, well, we need to research this. We don't, we don't know how uh, we're gonna do what you're asking us to do. So it's gonna take us time to do it. So, but you still are supposed to track all the capacity and the time an agile team is doing. So then you might use a story to do that then. Okay, then we're gonna create a research story. Now, uh, in terms of roles, so uh, there's a lot of different uh, uh, roles within an agile team. Some of them are you know, probably used to, this example is talking more like in the software space, you, know, you have developers or programmers, you might have testers, architect design, Well, you could see these in any you know, product space. Like that doesn't have to be software development. It could be development of your product, testing of the product, you know, we're creating new clothing. The ones, the terms that are might be uh, a little new to some people in the agile space is uh, team lead or scrum master, and then product owner. So we talked about product owner before, as you may recall, and product owner represents the stakeholders of the project, represents the client, the customer. So if your organization is implemented agile and your client might be another internal division, right? That could be your business or your client. So one of your members on your team is somebody who is a subject matter expert, hopefully in that business or that client group that you're working with. And they are now your product owner. So they, they you know, hopefully have gone through the Agile training, and then they are ultimately responsible for setting the direction and the prioritization of what's called the backlog, the when things are going to be released, to what extent do we think we need to build something to get a minimal viable product, or that is like the smallest unit of something that we can actually get value on. So like in that example of that commercial garage that I keep talking about. You know, like maybe we don't need to wait until we have three stories. Maybe we can release a one story garage, you know, and we can start developing the second story while people can still park downstairs. We get some value while we're, you know, iteratively working on the second floor. Um, so that's the product owner's responsibility in conjunction with the whole team because collaboration is supposed to be a big part of that job. The other role is Scrum Master. Now, Scrum Master, you can argue, is kind of a variation of a project manager. A Scrum Master is focused on this Agile Scrum team. Scrum Master is supposed to ensure coordination, support the team working together, and a big part of the Scrum Master is an attempt to try to remove obstacles from the team. So the developer, the testers, the architect, the analysts, whoever is the ones kind of doing the work, they can focus on the work. And the Scrum Master, oftentimes in combination with the product owner, they attempt to kind of tackle whatever comes at them. So if there's a lot of people who maybe want to meet with your team so they can hear about your progress, they can understand your obstacles, Oftentimes you might see the scrum master and product owners say, okay, you can meet with us, but our team is going to keep working. So that way you don't disturb them. And we will kind of take the brunt of meeting with you. Scrum master facil facilitates daily scrum, sprint initiatives, helps make sure communication between all the team members, new team members, you know, helps them kind of grow and mentor them, coaching, administrative tasks, such as conducting the meetings, collaboration, and so on, implementing the changes and all that. A product owner and scrum master usually work very closely together. And then this is an example of just one scrum team. And then we're gonna talk later when we start having a scale up scrum uh, and agile to larger organizations, you might see new roles that start to get involved and coordinate those scrum masters and those product owners. So I uh, touched on these concepts called backlog and sprint. 
So, and with then that there's other terms that we need to learn if we want to kind of be a little bit more agile savvy. So within the backlog side of things, there's this term called grooming. Now, grooming doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, grooming yourself or your hair, you know, but grooming in this case means understanding what you, you, your, you have in your uh, work queue to work on and helping to ensure you understand it. You have some gauge of the estimate or you at least identify what you don't know. And then you start prioritizing what is more important than uh, than other things in the queue. So you can see here on the left side of the screen, we have what's called a backlog, which is a work queue, right? And this is a nice example that applies to all of us in real life. We all have a ton of different things that we need to do, right? You know, I need to do my taxes. I need to clean my house. I need to do that one assignment my boss told me. I need to turn in that essay. I need to work on my capstone project, right? There's a lot of different things that are maybe in our backlog, and you know, and and at first glance it might all be unprioritized so you may have to write them all down you know as an individual start kind of putting notes to yourself about you know which one you think is more complicated which is bigger which is smaller than maybe priority and then you can start making sense about what do i need to do first you know maybe you have four months before your cash on projects due but your taxes are due next week so that might end up having to become number one item that you work on right so you start you using you're using this the same concept that you're doing as an individual managing your work queue is the same concept that an agile scrum team does when they uh, groom or go through their backlog or they're doing sprint planning so every sprint every iteration is supposed to have an element of grooming there you're supposed to always be revisiting what do we have that we need to work on what what, what have we done what do we have that we need to work on and also what's newly added to our queue because you know usually things don't stay stable right you know you have a new thing that pops up two months from now. So you might need to reprioritize your work. Your work. So that's where the grooming aspect continuously is there. So that team hopefully has a very good understanding about what is waiting for them, right? And they, they're always being fed work, right? That team should never be sitting idle. They should always have a backlog. Even if maybe one project is canceled, then that team can go to the next one, right? Because they have a backlog of things that need to happen. So if you think about like all the different features that you could add into like a commercial garage or like Gmail, even if you're not going to maybe work on, okay, spell, we're going to enhance spell check to make it more intuitive. Oh, we've decided to pause that project. No problem. Then we're going to work on the next thing, right? We're going to give you the ability to put, you know, animated, you know, emoticons into your email. So that's the next thing we're going to work on. That's the next item in our backlog. So you can see on the left side of the uh, grooming, you can see unprioritized backlog which is then groomed and prioritized. And then now you come out of it with a prioritized backlog. The big role that's supposedly helping with this is your product owner, because your product owner is the one that understands what the business, what the client, what the you know, end user is hoping to get from this. But it does take the whole team, right? Because one of the inputs that your team is gonna have to explain to the product owners may be, hey, what you're telling us is the number one importance is very, very complicated. So we realistically won't be able to actually show any uh, bang for a buck until maybe 12 iterations from now. If that's okay with you, we just want to make sure you know. So it's possible based on that feedback, the product owner might, might you know, say, okay, that's a great point. Let's actually make the second priority because we want to get some something out, you know, earlier than later. So we'll do that next. You know, so that negotiation, that dialogue, that needs to happen, and that's one of the uh, apparent benefits of uh, agile is that you have that open transparency. Now on the right side, you can see an actual sprint. We keep talking about sprints or iterations. So, you know, you've seen me already use this kind of graphic. And now you see coming out of that prioritization, you see these stories are being fed into that team. And every day there's what's called a daily scrum, right? A daily scrum is where that team is working on something together. And they're supposed to kind of a daily, and actually, and sometimes when they're working in person, they even stand up and they have what they call a stand-up meeting, where you're supposed to have a very brief, super efficient daily meeting that's called a daily scrum, every day when you're working on your item. And the daily scrum is not about going into an in-depth status report, debating and discussing the direction you want to go. It's just very quick, usually three questions, you know, uh, what are you working on? You know, what, what are you working on now? What's next? Uh, are there any issues? Right? And that's it, boom, boom, boom. And if there are any issues, if there's anything anybody has that they want to discuss with you, you just quickly say, okay, great, David and uh, you know, Anna will uh, talk about that afterwards. Okay, next, next, like very quick, 15 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, and then you're done. And then again, it's big, big uh, emphasis on transparency and being able to understand all the work that you and your colleagues are doing. 
and we're going to talk more about the daily scrum but that's that's an aspect of the daily scrum so you can see it here kind of playing out now and another visualization playing out with iterations going on so we have a grooming session occurring what we just talked about where the team is looking at the work that they just finished the work that they have to work on, all the work that's kind of backlogged behind them, and maybe new work is being added, prioritize what they need to do, put it in the next iteration, lock that iteration, so to speak, two to three weeks, whatever your organization decides. Oftentimes, Agile does two to three weeks, but that doesn't mean that it's set in stone. And then over the next two to three weeks, that's the work you're going to do, and you're going to have daily scrum meetings along the way. Another big part, as we mentioned, is like you know, the whole continual feedback, the whole continual improvement. And uh, so you need to have near the end of the sprint iteration, you're going to have a demo or an iteration review. And you may not have anything to demo, but whatever you can ideally show your internal team and maybe some key stakeholders, that's the big driver of Agile is being able to get that feedback earlier and quicker and, you know, uh, continuously. So maybe you can show mock-ups, maybe you can show one you know piece of a you know a shirt you're starting to develop you can just kind of show like the illustration that's starting to iteratively come together or you can have a demo like if you are able to have a full-on de demo you keep updating the website you're building and then you're you know you show the demo like you see now that we click here now it runs your credit check and it explains what's going on behind the scenes right but you want that demo so you can capture feedback or are we on the right track is there something maybe now uh, you didn't think we need to do, but now that you see it, you realize we need to do? Better to tell us now so we can start making changes in our next grooming session for the next iteration rather than wait six months, a year, and you know we have to go back and redo things. Then there's something called a retrospective. A retrospective is, again, uh, one of the benefits of Agile is trying to get that cohesiveness. So retrospective is when that team discusses, like, how do we feel we did? You know, it's, it's an internal reflection point. You know, you get together as a team, like, okay, great. You know, what do we think worked well? What do we think could do better? You know, what do we think is something that, you know, we can learn from? Lessons learned, best practices, right? You know, um, it, for those of you that have had, you know, projects, you know, in organizations and in personal life, and that's a common, uh, that's a common event, right? Best practice, lessons learned discussion. But what Agile tries to do is, you know, don't wait till your project is done. Do it continuously. Right? So you can make course corrections. It's all about feedback, feedback, feedback. So demo, iterative review, retrospective, demo, iterative review, retrospective, again and again and again. So you can see at the end of the iteration, we do that. Then we start the next iteration. Again, grooming session, daily scrums, start for the next two, three weeks. At the end, we have another demo. We have another retrospective, again and again and again and again. Right? You see, we start to iterate, reiterate, and we're moving ultimately towards, with Agile, an MVP, not to be confused as the most valuable player, but, but a minimal, a minimum viable product. That the minimum viable product is trying to say is that what's the smallest unit of whatever we're making that still offers value to our customer. So in that garage I'm talking about, maybe in the end we know we want a three-story garage with escalators and kiosks, but we have people that need to park sooner than later, right? So instead of waiting nine months to give them the whole thing, maybe in two months we can give them, you know, again, like a safe one story covered garage, at least it can get out of the rain. No fancy kiosks, no restrooms, no escalators, no need to have one because you don't have a second story yet. But your customers can start parking at least now, some of them, while you start working on the second story, hopefully safely ensuring none of it falls on the first story, but you start building the second story. So you could argue that one story is your MVP. Or if you're building a website or you're building like, you know, Gmail, if you're a part of Google is building Gmail in the beginning. For those of us that are old enough to remember, Gmail has gotten way more advanced than it used to be back in the day because they built the MVP. Well, here's the basic thing any web-based email needs to do. And then they added to it and added to it and added to it, right? Now to integrate with your calendar. Now it's smart enough to read your email and see the word attachment and say, hey, you didn't attach anything. Did you mean to do that? You know, you can schedule things now. You can snooze, right? Those are all things that are really nice to have, but do you need them for email? Maybe not. That may not be the MVP. So MVP is an attempt to try to deliver something sooner than later that adds value and you build on it but you don't wait then all the way until the end of a project before anybody sees any value and again we get feedback right feedback 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 so that's another advantage of delivering the mvp is we can get real life feedback and what do you think or, you know do you like the garage do you not like the garage do you like the gmail we just bit built or do not why why not um so for, i know a lot of you i believe are you know in uh, the project management course right now. And so you probably have been learning a lot about one of my favorite terms, which is called the triple constraint. So in project management, as you guys know, the triple constraint 
it's like the foundation of project management, right? There's three items that's kind of like a three-way tug of war, scope, cost, and time, right? That's, that's the triple constraint. And anytime you pull on one of those, you exert force on the other, right? So if you tell uh, somebody that we need you to do a project, and then one month into the project, you say, I'm going to double your scope. So okay, but now you're exerting force on time and costs. It's going to take us longer, and we're going to have to uh, pay more for this project, right? Because you just you pulled on one aspect of that three-way tug of war. So now you've exerted force on the other two. So that's the triple constraint. Now, on the left side of the screen, you can see what's typically the triple constraint paradigm in a waterfall project. We tend to lock in scope. So in a normal project, in a waterfall project, you might say, okay, we're going to build this garage. We have to document all of the requirements. We have to make sure we've captured everything. And then we're going to go to the client and say, okay, here, you sign off on these requirements before I move forward. Otherwise, I won't move forward until you sign off and tell me. And then we've locked you in, so to speak, to scope. That's where the terms like scope control, change control come into place. You want to change something? Great. We have to go back to the triple constraint. We have to potentially open a change control. You may have to pay more money, right? Because, you know, scope was locked. You're the one who agreed to the requirements. Now, Agile turns that on its head, right? Scope is now the flexible item. Right? You, can, you can do, as, as you guys might remember just from a few slides ago, you can change what you want to do. Oh, you want to do something else? That's fine. In the grooming session, the product owner in collaboration with the business and the stakeholders and the client, they can say, no, actually, we want you to do a different direction. We no longer want to work on this, or we don't want to green anymore. We want to blue. No problem, right? We'll work on something else. Then. You know, the scope is now the flexible item. What's locked in is usually cost and time. You're paying for a value stream for that agile scrum team to be in existence for six months, 12 months, or maybe forever. But you probably don't have access, you know, as far as like a project to that team forever, because you've been given perhaps a certain amount of story points that you're allowed to use that team for. So as long as you're within your story point allowment, you can have us do whatever you want. But at some point, with great power comes great responsibility. At some point, you might uh, run the risk of not finishing your project, because Agile doesn't lock in scope. So you can keep changing things as much as you want. You want the email to look differently? We'll change it. You want the garage to have a different color and you know you want all these fancy things before we even start building a second floor we'll do it because you know ultimately the product owner you know this is one that sets the direction but if you only have a certain amount of story points let's say that takes you six months out and we're now in month five and a half okay now we want to start working on floor two it's like sorry you know you used all of your scope by changing direction so many times which was your right but we're now out of path right we don't have enough capacity to be able to do the remaining things that you want to do so it does a nice job of flipping on its head, but it's still a consideration that the collective team needs to keep in mind. You can change a scope, but you should still be very careful when you do so. Right? Every time you change what the team's working on the next few iterations, you're potentially going to lose the ability to do something else. Everything is a trade-off, right? Everything is an opportunity cost. Okay, you want me to work on this, and two iterations from now, I won't be able to work on that. So it's still... The same triple constraint never goes away, right? You're just turning it around and you're just kind of using different terms as far as kind of your negotiation. Okay, so uh, this is what I was promising also where, you know, some stats about who's using Agile. So if you look at the right side of the screen, the number one, according to CIO.com, the number one industry that's adopted Agile is software, which is to be expected, right? It was, it was born in software and technology. So you can see why software is the biggest user. But you'll notice that a lot of other industries are using it too. Financial services is number two. Professional services like consulting firms, law firms, auditing, accounting firms, number three. And then insurance, healthcare, and then you can see kind of a bigger gap start to occur. Government, telecommunication, transportation, manufacturing. Now, what this doesn't show is what functions within those industries are using it. So what would be interesting, and unfortunately I don't have this information, but I'm just going to I'm just going to speculate. Most likely, even if we were to expand with third column, you'd probably see, even though a lot of these industries have adopted it, it's probably their software and IT departments that have adopted it. So yes, financial services is using it a lot, but most likely they're using it more for their software development, internal software, and like in their use with uh, financial tech and vendors. And then the biggest sources of business value you get from an agile transformation, meaning like your organization wasn't doing agile and now you decide you want to do agile, is you focus on what's important to the business, 
because the business is part of the effort, right? They have to change the way they, they do resourcing now. The business is actually giving up an individual to be part of your team. And then delivering better customer value because constant feedback, constant transparency, good or bad. So one thing I'm, I wanna say is like, you know, an anecdote I can, uh, I, I told you guys, I wanna be completely honest about kind of the real world implications is agile transformation is as great as all this is. And, and, and agile does have a lot of benefits. It's, it can be a very painful transformation. I have seen organizations go through an agile transformation and ultimately coming out of it, fast forward a year or two, are very grateful that they had made the change. But going through the transformation, it can look like a scene out of a Jerry Springer episode. And, you know, people are angry at each other in some of the planning sessions. There's, you know, you're no longer kind of hiding things from your client where you might usually tell your client, we'll work on that. And stuff is blown up behind the scenes in the warehouse, but, you know, you're kind of jumping on it and your client doesn't see anything because, you know, they're, they've walked away and they're doing something else. The difference with Agile is your client sees everything. Your client is the team. You don't hide anything anymore. You know, we don't know how to do what you're asking for. And you admit that we don't know what this is. We don't know what you're saying. We have to research it. And some of that is kind of frustrating to hear at times, right? And that is a frustrating culture change potentially for both sides, right? You know, you, one side might feel a little bit beaten up on, the other side might feel frustrated that they have to deal with this. And that that is part of the cultural shift that needs to occur with Agile. But doing so can deliver better customer value because now you have much better transparency and constant feedback faster value delivery, quicker releases. We're breaking things down to smaller pieces. We're hopefully targeting the minimum viable product. Better employee morale, because again, you know, once we achieve that collaboration and that transparency, people know what you're working on. It's, it's you know, it's not, it's not as necessarily, you know, behind the scenes, right? And streamlined work, hopefully, if done properly. Um, so there are a lot of metrics that are associated with Agile. I don't know we have, you know, at, at the LMU team, you know, I know we have a lot of focus on data. So um, I, I got a chance to meet some of the very impressive team. And I know like, you know, you guys have two pr predominant tracks, if I'm not mistaken, information systems and data as well. So I'm sure a lot of you guys, you know, who are on the data side, ears might be perking up. Agile doesn't mean that you get rid of structure and data. It just means you do things differently, right? So you do still have the concept of you know, what you're projected to do versus what you're supposed to do. So burn down is the amount of work that's been completed in an epic or sprint and the total amount remaining, right? You, you start burning down potentially a sprint within like, you know, a small sprint. And you might also have an epic that's being assigned to a, a, a scrum team. And you could see that epic start to burn down. Like you're starting to knock out some of the story points and some of the features that you were supposed to in that epic. You still have all these needs for control. So that's one of the things that some people, when they adopt Agile, they unfortunately don't always have that understanding. Agile is not just free form, you know, we'll do what we think we need to do. And there's, you know, don't put structure on us because you can't put a box on creativity. You still need all the key aspects that you have in project management, right? So, you know, the whole kind of control and monitoring side, you still need that. It's just that it's a different paradigm, right? Instead of waiting, you know, tracking a three, six month waterfall project, you have to control monitor iterations. And going back to that chart before, you have to understand how it touches on a, on a feature, on a uh, epic, on a theme. On the middle side, you can see the velocity, which is essentially how, how good, how efficient is that team getting? New agile teams struggle. Right? Imagine when you were on a first new team, you know, on your capstone project and your class in real life. It takes time, right? I mean, as you guys know from organizational behavior, like there's the stages of team formation, right? Like initially, there's usually, you know, that that kind of uncomfortable feeling about who's supposed to do what? I'm supposed to do this. How often are we meeting? I don't understand why I need to talk to you, right? That that takes time. Same thing with an agile. So usually the velocity for a newly formed agile team is not that great. But once you have a team that started to kind of build cohesiveness, you'll see that velocity get better and better. And that velocity is a measure of efficiency. It, you can also argue it's a measure of synergy. It's a measure to what extent that team is getting along, right? And then when you start seeing velocity potentially start to dive down, you know there's something going on with the team, right? Maybe a few of the team members are struggling, right? Maybe there's a, a complicated, you know, feature epic that you give the team and it's really hurting a team. So it is a very valuable efficiency metric as well as health metric. And then there's a lot of other metrics. Right? Just like everything else, there's a lot of other key performance indicators out there, right? Defects that you get during development. You know, you don't have to, in a waterfall, you might have to wait all the way towards the end. But, you know, in Agile, you might be seeing these defects iteratively, right? There's customer satisfaction, complaints, support requests. Ultimately, we should be aligning everything to our strategic goals or our themes. You know, there's a lot of different 
metrics that you know don't go away just because you're using agile um so and we are going to get to the uh simulation i'm just checking i'm okay on time yep okay so uh ch some challenges with the use of agile and all of you are going to get this deck so you know in case some of you are writing this down um you know uh, we will get you a copy of this deck so you can have a copy so you know don't worry about like you know having to take notes but challenges with the use of agile um i'm not going to go through all of these but like you know teams sometimes struggle with the focus right as i mentioned it, it is an organizational shift it is a culture shift longer term uh, projects can suffer from incremental delivery, right? Because that's that's a very hard thing to kind of sustain. Level of collaboration can be difficult. Um, I mentioned, like, you know, if we start skipping around a little bit, like rolling out Agile to only one part of an organization, but not the other, we usually, uh, unfortunately, create in challenges and potentially even failure. You know, if if you are rolling out your uh, Agile practices only only to an IT department, but the, I, the business departments of that IT department supports haven't also been tra trained on agile and are not staffing in an agile mentality that is at least you know giving them product owners as their contribution to the agile then you're going to see it suffer because you're not really doing agile then right you're you're just doing some attempt at kind of like iterative work within a waterfall approach so a lot of the benefits that you might get from agile are probably going to be reduced and then you know uh, sometimes some of the work uh, may, may not work if the customer is not really clear on their goals, right? Because you might end up burning a lot of iterations before your customer really starts to understand. And, you know, training, continual development, a definition of done is a popular term that's used in Agile. You know, what do you mean, where do we stop? Like, how do we know when an epic is done? Because, you know, we, we had this concept of an MVP and continually making it better. But at some point, we may have to, like, say, this is as good as we're going to get it and we need to move to the next item. So how do we define that? So like anything else, you know, an organization hits, uh, you know, these challenges with Agile can be overcome, right? So it's just understanding them, customizing how we implement Agile, how we, you know, do it. Um, from what I've seen, again, you know, like uh, pure Agile from a textbook is very rare in organizations. What you end up seeing is that organization's attempt at adapting Agile to their culture, to their business needs, to the strategy, to their geographical footprint, right? So companies customize how they do Agile and that's totally fine. Some people might say like, hey, you're not doing Agile the way that I saw it, like, you know, read in a textbook, but that's not really in my humble opinion, the right lens to be looking at. Like, are you achieving the results you wanted to achieve? You know, are you getting the transparency, the feedback? Are you starting to see, you know, um, more and more people working on this together and more clarity then you know you are potentially getting the advancement you need as an organization and you can mature at your own rate you can customize it at your own needs okay so i'm going to keep going because until a moderator tells me i see questions but i'm not looking at them until a moderator tells me that there are questions so one of the um, actually uh, david yes, there are questions sorry okay. hi this is nola um just just really quick because they're they're starting to come in. So I'm gonna start yeah. from Bob and Dale, I'll get to your question, but let me start from the audience's question. Um, is the switch from waterfall to agile down all at once or is it more of a phased approach? That's a great question. Uh, I I think, it, and so uh, I was joking with the faculty before we joined the classes and you guys are gonna hear me say a lot of this answer too is, you know, some of my answers sound like a politician running for office. So the answer is it depends. I don't know if there is a right or wrong answer. Um, usually you're gonna see it phase, is what I would say. Usually you see it phase over because it can be, again, a big transition to all of a sudden flip. Just think about all the different terms that we had to learn just to get through this, this presentation. Like imagine if this is your job that you're doing day in and day out and you have to understand these terms, you have to change your whole way of working. There's even, there's different tools that you might use for agile than you would for kind of normal work, right? So usually it's phased over, but that doesn't mean that your organization can't decide you know, to kind of do a big bang approach and convert it all at once, right? Maybe train you a lot along the way, agile coaches and all this training as you do your kind of normal approach. And then also one day say, we are now agile and we'll just, you know, kind of hit that wall together and adjust. But I would say arguably, usually you should see a transition. Okay, and question. a follow-up question to that. Um, if your client changes their desired features and you run out of time and or cost, how do you prevent them from being upset with you? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. <laughs> and the answer is you may not ever be able to prevent them. But uh, it, it, all joking aside, the, the transparency aspect of Agile is what ultimately you would hope would be preventing anybody from getting upset. Because in a waterfall approach, you might see cases where, you know, you come back and you say like, okay, it's been six months, but we're going to need another two months. 
and you can see like why, why is it taking so long why am i not getting what i want well we're sorry we've been taking the last you know three or four months that we haven't really connected with you too much trying to figure out how to do it but in agile that's not supposed to be the case right because in agile that same person who's saying like well how come you can't finish it has been the one telling you what to work on right or you know or at least is the representative from their stakeholders if it's done properly the product owner is supposed to be the interface to all the stakeholders they represent so the product owner is the one telling you what to work on and that agile team is hopefully making sure the product owner understands okay we'll work on what you want but we're running out of runway right so that product owner should be communicating very clearly to all the people that he or she supports so i would argue transparency is really the way to try to make sure they don't get upset and again, it's a culture shift, right? So probably in the beginning, you're going to hit that wall. And like I mentioned, it'll be something like out of a Jerry Springer episode. But once you get through that a few times, you know, people will start to understand. With great power comes great responsibility. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, we do have another question. Forrest, thank you for your question. What is the impact on employee morale productiv or productivity inside an agile organization compared to waterfall? So... Uh, so ultimately, if you know, let me uh, jump up a little bit. So ultimately, if you remember, you know, according to Cap Gemini, the argument is better employee morale, right? But I think the answer is again, it'll depend on how your organization does it. There are some organizations that have not really implemented agile in a proper way. So if we go back to these kind of challenges, if you think about an organization that's only implemented agile to some of the team and invested the time to train and build relationships with only some of the team to do agile, but that team needs other people. Like if you're only having your IT team do it, but not all the business partners they work with, you can imagine it's gonna be a very frustrating experience, right? And you can see morale start going down. Agile takes investment, just like anything you do. If you're changing the way, the paradigm of how you deliver change, then you need to make sure that people understand the terminology, the lingo, right? You know, this concept of MVP, the whole fact that we're assigning people in a different way. You don't get to just walk away once you give me the requirements. You know, you're sitting at the table with me. You're the product owner. So uh, so ultimately, if done right, it should hopefully increase morale because people feel, they feel more seen. They feel like my uh, impact and my, you know, uh, value that I'm delivering is more clearly seen, right? Because there's my, my client to some extent is sitting at the table with me and they can see the fact that me as a developer, me as an analyst, me as a tester, you know, whatever role I might be, scrum master, you know, I'm a little bit more easily seen, right? Things are broken down. They're not this huge team that sometimes you can kind of feel hidden behind, but it has to be done properly. And you need all those other things to occur too. You need the investment, you need the training, you need the culture time, you need the top down buy-in. Good question. <laughs> Fantastic. And we have one that's somewhat similar but different. So how can an organization resolve friction when it has both waterfall and agile teams? That is a great question. And that is also one of the uh, challenges that I didn't get a ch chance to touch on, but I'm glad that you uh, and whoever asked the question touched on it. So oftentimes within the same organization, you might have some teams that are doing agile, some teams are doing waterfall, or in reality, you know, most organizations don't exist in a bubble. They have to work with, you know, outside entities, government agencies, you know, vendors, fintech companies, whatever is, you know, the nature of your organization. Now, like, you know, one of you may be agile, one of you may be waterfall, or actually you both might even be agile and you might do things differently, right? You might have defined your sprint to be two weeks and then you're, you know, the, this other company said that they're doing four weeks. So uh, integration points is a big challenge with, with agile, right? And, and any delivery methodology. So usually what you try to do in those cases is you focus on the integration points. Like, okay, how do we, when do we need to kind of figure out a cadence where we can kind of make sure that we're matching each other and we're integrating when we need to? Right, those are the, that's the, the big attempt to try to deliver when possible when you have different methodologies, you know, different types of agile, agile versus waterfalls. Like we need to focus on the integration points because we still need to deliver, we still need to move forward. So going back to those terms we talked about before, like themes and goals, we need to start making sure we understand where we do match, right? You know, we, we have the same goal, we have the same theme. Okay, let's start breaking it down to see then we're gonna deliver iteratively, you're gonna deliver, you know, in a longer stretch, then here's when we need to make sure we plug into each other so we don't slow each other down. So those integration points are the necessary adaptation to be able to hopefully try to address that challenge. Great, and um, we have one more question here and then we'll go into the simulation since I'm looking at the time. Um, in your experience, what percentage of clients have you seen actively participating in the agile process? 
attending sprint meetings and all? I, uh, well, I can't claim to know the entire industry. So I will say like at Bank of America in, in our department, um, you know, we've done a very good job, I think, um, you know, and we, we, you know, we didn't have to go through, as I mentioned, like a learning curve and that kind of cultural shift. But in our department, uh, we have consistent attendance with our clients and our clients are internal. So like, you know, I work in consumer lending and credit underwriting technology, as I'm sure you guys all memorized my background from the beginning. So our clients are internal because our internal clients are like the business groups that they understand, like in the customers that are applying for a home loan or for a vehicle loan and such. So they have uh, adapted to Agile just as us on the IT side have done. And they, they are attending the program increment planning sessions where we plan what we're, we're going to do over three months. They're, they've assigned product owners to be part of the teams. So there is consistent attendance, but that transition was painful. So there was in the beginning, there was a lot of pushback, like, why do I need to attend all these things, right? We told you what we want to do, and you're supposed to go figure it out. It's like, well, that's not agile, right? That's not how we do things anymore. So that, that transition can be, again, very painful. But if you can get through the transition together without throwing a chair at one another, then, you know, you can hopefully start building these better practices. In real life, you know, one thing I will say, like, you know, I've heard, you know, from colleagues, you know, I've seen... And, you know, um, uh, outside of Bank of America, yeah, in real life, that is a big struggle, right? You might ultimately, if you're a vendor to a larger company and you do agile and that larger company says, we don't want to do it, right? You know, it's your job to tell us, you know, to, you know, we're just going to give it to you and you have to figure it out. So you may have to come to that realization, right? You might have some clients that say, we don't want to do it. We're not going to give you a product owner. So you ultimately, how do you handle that? You may have to like figure out subject matter expertise. You have to have somebody who's connecting to understand the business needs of that person. So you can kind of simulate maybe a product owner relationship. So there are ways around it. And the reality to whoever asked a great question is you're right. There will be times that you're not going to have consistent use. So, you know, your organization needs to figure out how you can work around it. Or if it's so bad that you're not having the use where the whole structure starting to fall apart, then maybe you should really look at the fact that do, should we even be doing agile, right? Because we're not getting the adoption we need with an organization. Maybe we should revert back to waterfall. And that's, that's okay, right? Some organizations, you know, waterfall is what's right for them. Great, great. Well, that's all of our questions for now. So back okay. to you. Thank you. Great, great questions. Thank you guys. Feel free to keep them coming. So we're not at the simulation just yet. Um, one more thing I wanted to talk about, which is what this screen is. And again, you're going to get a copy of this deck, so you don't have to worry about squinting. But I mentioned this, there's this concept of like scaling Agile up. So Agile works very well, like it's just normal Agile, so to speak, a few, you know, Agile Scrum teams. It works very well for small organizations, right? Like, you know, that they can all kind of sit at the table together and like, you know, they're working on like a few projects. But think about when you start scaling these up to like massive organizations, right? Like, you know, multinational corporations. It can be very difficult. Like, how are you going to have... You know, you're, you're talking about like small organization, maybe managing three, four, five, ten agile scrum teams. And then you have larger organizations that can potentially have like different departments, divisions, ge geographical locations, and they can have like 40, 50, 60 agile teams. That's very difficult. You know, you're just going to rely on them all talking to each other. So there are different ways to scale up agile. Uh, there's safe, there's scrum of scrums, there's discipline agile delivery. The Largest one, according to the, the only real metric I could find was, you know, an organization called Vitality Chicago is SAFE. SAFE tends to be the most used scaling up approach. And I will say that is what we use at Bank of America. SAFE stands for Scaled Agile Framework. And the lowercase e is for enterprises. <laughs> scaled Agile Framework for enterprises. And that diagram you see in the upper left corner, that's straight from the SAFE website. And there's no way I'm going to go into that diagram because we would, we would definitely need a few more sessions in a row. But what I will say, I'll, I pulled out some of what I think are the big things to get from SAFE because I do think this is a valuable item. A lot of us work in larger corporations, so we don't have the, you know, the luxury, so to speak, of working kind of in a small agile team. We have to deal with these larger concepts. So SAFE adds a few more uh, new lingos that we need to learn. So. In talking about time increments, you know, typical agile might just be you're focusing on your sprint, two to four, four week sprints, smaller scale, fewer teams. Now you're talking about safe, you can have large scale teams, you know, 20, 30, 40 agile teams. And now at the at that level, you start kind of putting a planning towards an entire quarter or member program increment. So it's your attempt to kind of herd all of these agile teams in the same direction. So 
when you're doing safe, you kind of decide those, remember those themes and those epics at the higher level, you have program managers and release train engineers that are helping a set direction saying, okay, we have all these themes for the next three months, we've decided you 30 agile teams are going to focus on this theme, these four epics. And then we have started pre-assigning you some of the uh, features underneath that. And then you have what's called a program increment planning session that like, is two, three days long. And it is like kind of, you know, all teams are present. All the agile scrum, scrum teams are present virtually or in person. And you go through all that concept. Okay, we have these three epics, 20 epics, whatever your organization makes sense that we're going to work on for the next three months. We've given some pre-assignments of the features and stories to different teams. And then the teams go back. They see if they feel like they are the right people that have the skill set for that particular item. Do they think they have the capacity for it? They come back again. They discuss and negotiate. And you can see assignments shift around. So that's how you're kind of herding all these agile teams in the same direction. Safe is a way to kind of put agile and scale it up. Are you program increments, your program increment plannings? You have two new resources. You have a program manager, which organizes and to some extent coordinates all of the product owners. And then you have a release train engineer, which sometimes I've seen a lot of them actually, they do bring like a, a, a train whistle or the hat just for fun that coordinates a lot of scrum masters underneath him or her, right? So those are two new roles that also the nice thing about that from when organizations do have that also gives you a career path, right? Like if you want to be a scrum master, then ultimately from a scrum master, you can become a release train engineer. Or if you want to be a product owner, maybe ultimately you might want to become a program manager. Strategic direction wise, uh, typical agile, you know, smaller teams are setting their own direction. Remember that product owner is the one that's supposed to set that direction. But as I mentioned with safe, a bit different, right? You're in this release train of these, you know, 20, 30, 40 agile teams that are all working in the same department maybe. So the strategic direction is set by potentially the program manager and the stakeholders with, you know, feedback from everybody. Then each agile team inherits that strategic direction and your product owner still sets the direction of what you work on in your stories, but they have to be aligned to that overall program increment direction. So some new roles for us in the uh, scaled up approach. Now, this is the mini uh, simulation we're going to do, and we'll go quick. So because I want to try to have time for Q&A. Plus, I want to show you guys some of the slides I've put in the appendix for you to kind of like read it your own so you have it. But in this simulation, and this is something that a lot of us had to go through in real life, we're going to talk about like an organization that's currently set up to be all in office. And now we've decided to move to a remote work environment, which is like what all of us had to do, you know, a lot of us had to do, I should say, in like early 2020. And but it's not, and, but let's, let's not use the pandemic as an example for this one. Like we've decided we want to become virtual, but you know, real life, you know, constraint, our office lease is up in six months. And let's say we're a small organization with like 20-ish employees. I mean, I don't know if anybody just wants to like say in chat, am I allowed to see the chat? I can see the chat. If you want to see just in chat, like what do you think would be an example of a theme? So in this scenario, what is the theme here? Remember themes like a one, three year vision. So what, you know, what do you think is the goal that we're trying to do here? And you can just type in the chat. Okay, I'll tell you since <laughs> I don't know if I have time. I don't know if people are typing the chat. I don't see. Save money in the lease. There you go, Dean Smith. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, save money in the lease. Like I mean, like your, your theme could be essentially enabling a flexible uh, work environment. And to to the dean's point, um, you know, kind of not as not as dependent anymore on one particular location, save money on the lease, right? You, you have a virtual environment. Plus you could see another thing coming into play. Maybe you want, you know, redundant workforce, right? You want the ability to work in different time zones. Like, you know, you could start, if you have a virtual environment, you may not have to be all in one spot. You have some people across the US. So now we have time zone, you know, benefits as well. So, you know, it, those could be all different themes that ultimately, you know, enables this particular, you know, goal. And Epic, so I'll just, I'll just keep going because you know, I'm not, and then if, if you guys have comments, you can put in the chat because I have it in front of me now, but an epic that's spanning multiple quarters, there could be different projects we can put into here. The first project you can imagine is we need to figure out how to wind down this lease in the, in the best way po uh, possible. So we might have an epic that talks about understanding the lease, understanding how we wind it down. You know, are, are there any, uh, you know, are, are there any aspects of the lease that we need to, um, you know, pay particular consideration for? Can we start, you know, at, winding down earlier if we're ready for it or no do we have to are we locked into the very end what about the furniture in the building is that our furniture what about the telecommunications 
the office, you know, uh, is leased for six months, but like, what about, are we the ones paying for telecommunications? Is there a lease on that? Another epic could be what technology do we need to give our employees to be able to enable them to be remote workforce? Do we need to pay for their internet? Do will our employees even have a strong enough internet connection? Like, are, you know, is it possible some of our employees live in an environment where they don't you know? So maybe we might need to invest in some infrastructure that we can send out to, uh, to some of our employees. Like I, I've known one organization that enabled a work uh, from home uh, environment where it actually would send and it would have a phone line that was to that organization was installed by technicians for that organization in your own home office. And then it would put the, a docking station again that was from that organization so you could work from home. So it wanted to try to make sure your home environment was enabled for you to be able to work virtually. So those are all epics we could do. And then I kind of already touched on the features underneath that, right? That enabling with the infrastructure, you could see the features underneath that about, you know, the technology that needs to be there, the infrastructure, the training, what cultural things that we need to do differently than we, we used to have team meetings on person. How are we going to do it virtually? And then you can see the story start kind of coming out underneath that. Okay, we need to study. maybe how other organizations, you know, we're going to do in order to implement it. So you can start seeing more and more how we break this down to smaller and smaller benefits. And let's say if we find out the lease does allow us to potentially go in phases, we could potentially then have an MVP here that's like, you know, get 10 employees out to virtual, reduce our lease by half and 10 employees in the office. And that way we start seeing a hybrid environment and we get some, remember big thing about agile, we get some feedback immediately and we start seeing that feedback occur. So, uh, again, if you guys have any thoughts on it, like, so, uh, you know, if we were doing a features prioritization, I think we'll save it here just because I took so much time in the foundation. But if we were doing a features prioritization and we were looking at, let's say, the epic about the kind of technology and the resources that you would need to be able to do things virtually, you know, we could have a lot of different features here, right? What's the, uh, what's the, te what's the technology, what's the internet technology we might need to give people? Do we need to pay for the internet? Uh, what about our support model? Like when we used to have an IT guy that sat in the office with us, but now everybody's virtual, you know, is Fred supposed to go and uh, go to everybody's house or maybe we, um, you know, uh, let Fred go or give him a different role. And instead we have a virtual support model, right? There's a lot of different features that we would need, would need to prioritize as this agile scrum team that's doing this operational project, right? And then we would prioritize those and start putting those in iterations and start, you know, kind of knocking them out slowly as we go through. So that was, that was an example of, uh, you know, that was a quick, very high level example of, you know, talking about how we could establish themes, epics, features, stories, you know, a little bit of the, you know, grooming feature prioritization that we talked about that occurs. And then this next one is kind of an example of what you could see in a daily scrum. So in a daily scrum, we might, you know, in daily scrum, oftentimes, like I mentioned, there's usually three questions uh, that's touched on, right? What did you do yesterday? What are you going to do today? And are there any challenges or impediments? And that's the daily scrum. So if, if like, you know, I'm going to pick on Joel because he was the last one that was nice enough to chat with me. If Joel and I were on the project together, and we're working on, you know, the Agile Scrum team that's, you know, talking about the kind of like, let's say support model. So I might ask Joel, like, what did you do yesterday? Okay, yesterday I, I talked to Fred to understand, like, you know, um, you know, what he does to support. Okay, what are you going to do today? Well, today I need to figure out some of the vendors that are out there that provide virtual support models and stuff. Okay, is there anything that's uh, blocking? Yeah, like one of the vendors that we were, was listed by our organization as the top vendor, they're not returning my calls for some reason. So, okay, so, um, why don't you connect with, you know, a... Uh, why don't we connect with Jennifer after this and see if she can help you get a new contact on that vendor and then next. And then we move to the next person. We keep going and going, right? You don't solve problems on the daily scrum call, but you identify them and then you take them offline and you just keep going, right? The, the point is transparency and to get through the daily scrum, uh, scrum call very quickly. So this is a, this was our attempt at a simulation. So going to Joel's question, is each epic worked on by different team or does the same team work on multiple epics? That's a great question. And the answer is it can be both. It can be either. It depends on your organization. So if we're talking about organizations like scaled up, you know, using like, let's say safe, um, it, it might come down to whether your team is the right one that has the capacity and the skill set to do it, right? You might have an organization that has many different agile scrum teams, but they all focus on different aspects. Maybe you have some agile scrum teams that are more focused on like, let's say the accounting versus the marketing aspects. So if an epic might be really all marketing kind of epic, you know, there might be some teams that say that that's not, that's not something that we are good at, right? You know, our velocity will suffer if we take it. We, we don't have that subject matter expertise in doing it. So you, you may want to give that epic to team five. And sometimes some agile teams give each other fun names. You, know, you might want to give that epic 
to Team Lightning because, you know, us over here and, you know, in Team Thunderbolt, you know, we don't do that. Um, but it is possible. You know, it just depends on a negotiation about what that Epic is asking the teams to do and to what extent you've kind of specialized some of your teams to focus in different areas. So like in software development, you know, um, a lot of organizations will have agile teams that are more focused on the particular technology or particular systems within that organization. So to what extent does your Epic hit only one system or multiple systems? So you could see potentially six, eight, 12 Agile Scrum teams all touching on your Epic a little bit because it crosses a lot of systems. That's a good question, Joel. So uh, you guys can keep it. So that was the simulation. So one of, one of the things I want to show you, because I know we're down to eight minutes, I just wanted to show you that there's some appendix slides that you guys are going to get in this presentation. Um, just so you know they're there. One of the questions I'm asked often is like, well, can you give examples of when Agile, like, is there real life examples of when Agile has been done in a non-tech environment? So I'm not going to go through them today, but you have them uh, on the deck that's going to be given to you. Yes. And here's, you know, some, I actually researched for you some real life examples of when Agile has been done in a non-tech environment. Right. You can see Lego NPR, National Bank of Canada, and Lonely Planet. Right. And then also there is other types of Agile that we didn't get a chance to talk about. All right. There's Agile Kanban. Um, also, there's a lot of tools that come with the Agile space. So some of you who have done Agile, you probably have heard a lot of these tools. Like Jira or Jira, depending on how you, you know, pronounce it, is the arguably the biggest one. I couldn't find anything that showed market share, all these tools, but I think arguably most people would say, yeah, Jira is the number one agile related tool out there. And it's ultimately been blown by, bought by uh, Atlassian, right? Which has Jira, Trello, status page, and so others. Broadcam, Rally has Rally software. Microsoft, of course, never not in the space of something has Azure DevOps. So there are a lot of different uh, tools that are out there, a lot of different softwares that can enable your organization to do uh, sprints, to have grooming sessions, to have what's called vote of confidence. Like a lot of these tools have that functionality built in. Those dashboards, like you remember I showed up above velocity and burn rate. I was showing examples from Atlassian. So those are from Jira that were showing like burn reports. So if you use the tools properly, they can help you both with the data as well as the kind of tactical steps that you need to do. And then there's a lot of tips on uh, included here from Atlassian as well as like, outside on tips on how to do Agile in a distributed or remote environment because that is a real life concern. And then I know one of the questions that we were talking about before we opened it up to everybody is what about certificates? There is no shortage of Agile certificates as you can see here on the screen. Project Management Institute, but, you know, which I have a PMP, not an Agile certificate, but the Project Management Institute has a lot of its own certificates in the space. They have new ones that are coming out this year. There was a uh, purchase or merger, you know, with a uh, discipline agile is now kind of like within the PMI space in terms of certificates. There's a lot of discipline agile certificates that are coming out. Scrum Alliance is a real big player in this space. A lot of you probably have heard of like certified scrum master, certified product owner, certified agile leadership. So they have a lot of certificates. Scaled agile, which is that one I just showed you about scaling up. They have their own. And then there's internationally, there's even more. Right. Scrum.org, Prince2, you know, so on and so forth. So you have all that here. I know one of the questions I was asked before we opened up is, do I recommend getting a certificate? So I just want to touch on that. Like, ultimately, I think getting a certificate is really your own choice, and you need to understand why you want to do it. What do you hope to come from it? Don't think of a certificate as automatically a golden key that will open all doors for you, but why do you want it? Like, do you think it will, it, you know, do you think you have the, the good work experience and, you know, obviously a great degree coming out of Loyal Marymount University and the Agile certificate, just that nice, you know, thing you're going to put over the edge? And if, you, if that's what you want with it, great. But just remember, like, you know, you shouldn't just rest all on it. You should still try your best, like, you know, get as much experience as you can through your capstone project, through internships, through, you know, work experience. An Agile certificate is a great item to have. I have a project management professional certificate, and I got mine for a very specific reason. And, I, and you know, you should try to think about the reason why you want your Agile certificate. And uh, there's some references here for you. So I'm going to pause with an entire five minutes remaining. Are there any other questions that you guys have? Yes, please do type in your questions um, as they come in. But for now, um, David, would you mind? Um, there is a question that came from Joel. And as you answer his question, may I put up our CBA Advantage please. QR code for our um, freshmen who are here and joining us? So thank you all for joining us today, especially our freshmen. Let me just 
pull up that slide. Okay, so you all should be able to scan that. So um, David, please feel free to answer Joel's question. I, I, I think you can see his question. Yeah. Which, which Agile certificate do I think uh, wouldn't make sense? You know, Joel, it's a, so Joel, again, another great question. Uh, honestly, the, the answer depends. I, I was joking with the faculty before I joined that like that's you know, part of almost all my answers depends. It depends on what you want to do with Agile and what you want to do in Agile. So there, as you saw on the screen earlier, and you're going to get a copy of the deck, there's a lot of different certificates that are out there. So do you, are, are you somebody that you want to kind of like, you know, go and uh, be a scrum master? Master, and then you ultimately, you know, kind of advance up that career chain, like, you know, be scrum master and then kind of more senior scrum master and then ultimately um, release train engineer. No, then you may want to look into like a certified scrum master, but are you not sure? Then, you know, maybe you might want to look into kind of like an agile practitioner. So uh, I, I don't know that there's any one answer is my, my <clears throat> brief way of uh, responding to that. Sorry, your question choked me up. <laughs> um, fantastic. We, we have another question here from Forrest. Um, what experience caused you to become more interested in the Agile, mo and the Agile model? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, ultimately, um, organizations were adopting it. So um, what ultimately you know, made us, I think, as an industry want to understand more about Agile uh, for us is just being able to deliver better value for our customers and understanding how we can be quicker to market, right? So uh, financial services, which is, you know, where I'm in, you know, like we obviously have to worry about like a lot of regulatory requirements. We have to worry about the safety of your financial data. Like I'm sure you don't want us to be too, um, you know, too risk risky, you know, like and you go to your ATM and there's nothing available for you, right? So we have to balance all those things, but we also have to be very cognizant of the fact that there, you know, there's smaller companies out there that are offering solutions to you right away, right? There are, um, you know, FinTech, tech companies that are offering solutions to you right away. And, you know, more and more, I think the consumer group of financial services in all industries demand change constantly, right? And so I think that is one of the reasons you see a lot of organizations and, you know, a lot of individuals like myself, like look more towards agile, like what can we do to deliver change more quickly and, uh, you know, be able to uh, deliver more and more value to our customers. And thank you, Katie and Emma for the comments. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, oh, Mimi. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, for, for your comments. Um, I think, well, since we don't have, seems to have no more questions coming in, Anna, did you want to close up for, because I know this is also part of your class? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, David, thank you for speaking to our LMU community, for introducing Agile now uh, our students have the vocabulary, they have the process, they have the roles, and they even got introduced to a brief simulation. So they, they know they are prepared to go out into the real world and practice agile as they get put on, as they get placed on various pro projects. Thank you, David. You're very welcome. Thank you all. <laughs>